This one's on the top 10 historical facts that aren't true. Hello, I'm Simon Whistler. You're watching Top 10's Net, and in the video today, we're looking at the top 10 historical facts that aren't actually true. Number 10. Columbus was the first European to discover America. While this old belief has been largely expunged from the historical record today, at one point it was believed as a fact by generations of schoolchildren and is still maintained as true by some adults even today. Of course, mm. the truth is that the Vikings preceded Columbus by centuries and may have even built small villages in the New World hundreds of years before Columbus was born. Even if that weren't the case, however, from a purely technical perspective, Columbus never actually touched foot onto what is today the United States, spending Good all of point. his time in the East Indies. No. I think even when I was in school, I wasn't taught that Columbus was the first European to discover the New World. But they spoke about that in a funny way on the History of the World I Guess video, because Columbus went to Cuba, thought it was Japan, and then he was on the Bahamas and mistook that for China. But I kind of understand the miscalibration because if you've seen those maps they were using back then, they're a bit wonky. Number 9. People in Columbus's time thought that the world was flat. Closely related to the belief that Columbus discovered America is the belief, again less prevalent today than it was half a century ago, that most people in his day believed the Earth was flat and if Columbus sailed too far out, he would fall off its edge. In reality, I've heard flat earthers use this as justification for flat earth theory. The notion that the earth was flat had been refuted by the ancient Greeks, who were even able to calculate its circumference with astonishing precision, and so was not held to be a fact by any but the most primitive cultures at the time. Number 8. Hitler seized power in Germany by force. Many people hold the misconception that the Nazis seized power in Germany, but nothing could be further from the truth. The fact is that the Nazis came to power through free and fair elections, and even used the democratic process to secure that power. In effect, Adolf Hitler, appealing to the very legitimate grievances and fears of the German people, used the ballot box to achieve the powerful position of chancellor, and then used that very same process to destroy democracy by having the the legislature grant him the emergency powers he convinced them was necessary to restore order. Number 7. I know I've brought up this title in a past video, but I think one of the best books, in my opinion, that get into what he just explained was Rise and Fall of the Third Reich. If you like reading about World War II, this is such a good one, from the perspective of a war correspondent who starts the book before Hitler is born, and then goes into what life was after the war, and then everything in between. There are some free audiobook versions of that floating around, so I'm going to try to find you one, and I'll link it in the bio if I can. The stock market crash of 1929 started the Great Depression. Of all the misconceptions surrounding that dark era in American history, the idea that the crash of October 1929 kicked off the Great Depression is the most obstinate. The fact is that the Great Depression was caused by a number of factors, each of which went into making it a deeper and more enduring economic downturn than it would have been otherwise. Instead of letting the market make its own corrections and wait it out, they passed legislation, such as the Smoot-Hawley Act, that raised tariffs on imports, which was designed to make it cheaper to buy American products. The problem is, they didn't anticipate that foreign governments would raise tariffs on American goods in response, thereby killing exports and forcing the mass closure of many factories. Bad government policies also caused many banks to fail, wiping out the life savings of millions of Americans, which further exacerbated the problem. Number 6. Japan had to attack America if it wanted to survive economically. The belief that Japan was largely forced into attacking the United States because of the crippling embargo America had imposed upon it in response to its aggression in China is debatable. Japan had two options available to her other than attacking the Pacific Fleet at Pearl Harbor. 
First, it could have negotiated an end to her four-year-long war with China, which Japan was unwilling to do, or it could have simply seized the oil and mineral riches of the Dutch East Indies, modern-day Indonesia, and the Malay Peninsula directly without involving America at all. Consider for a moment that if the US was unwilling to go to war in Europe to assist Great Britain in its struggle with Nazi Germany, what were the chances Congress could have been persuaded to take on the Japanese over the Dutch East Indies? in Malaysia. Number 5. If Lee had won at Gettysburg, the South would have won the Civil War. It is widely believed that the Union victory at Gettysburg in July of 1863 prevented the North from complete collapse, but a careful look at the overall strategic situation at the time demonstrates this to have been unlikely. First, even if Lee had routed Meade's army at Gettysburg, it would have come at considerable cost, especially considering the number of Union troops Lee faced, over 90,000 compared to his own 70,000 men. This means that even if he had been victorious, Lee would have emerged from the battle with a largely exhausted and depleted force left with which to march on Washington almost 100 miles away. Additionally, Gettysburg would have been only the first in a string of obstacles he would have had to overcome as he moved east. Eventually, he would have to retreat back into Virginia in any case, and though he could add another Confederate victory to the long list of victories Lee had enjoyed up to that point in the war, the South simply couldn't match the North's almost unlimited industrial capability and was doomed to eventually lose in any case. Number 4. Lincoln's Emancipation Proclamation Freed the Slaves most students grow up believing that the Emancipation Proclamation freed the slaves, but it did no such thing. First of all, it only applied to slaves living within the Confederate States, and since the North had no power to enforce the proclamation in those territories not under its direct control, it really had no immediate effect on freeing anyone. In fact, it didn't even free those slaves in the Northern States, where slave ownership, while uncommon, was still legal. It was only illegal to buy and sell slaves in the North, not own them. It would take the 13th Amendment, ratified in 1865, to do that, Loophole. and it applied throughout the country, not just parts of it. Number 3. Lindbergh was the first person to fly across the Atlantic. While Lucky Lindy won fame and fortune for his death, I think that one is just that he was the first to fly solo, so it's more impressive than the two who went together, because those other two guys, I don't, they weren't American, they were from. England, I think. They had each other, but they also went non-stop, I believe. Now I'm not sure, maybe he'll get into During it. During solo jaunt across probably. the Atlantic in 1927, he was far from the first to cross the ocean by air. In fact, two British pilots, Alcock and Brown, had made the crossing years earlier in a repurposed British. RAF bomber. They flew from St. John's, Newfoundland to Galway, Ireland in just under 16 hours in 1919. That flight paved the way for commercial transatlantic aviation and made Lindbergh's future flight possible. Further, just a couple of weeks after the British duo had made their flight, the British airship R-34, with a couple of dozen crew and passengers on board, made a double crossing, taking about four days to cross both ways. In fact, by the time Lindbergh made his world-famous crossing, close to 80 men had already made the epic journey. His, however, was done entirely solo, and clocking in at almost 34 hours of straight flying time was a far more challenging and grueling feat. Number 2. Custer's 7th Cavalry was wiped out at Little Bighorn while many assume that Custer's entire command was wiped out at the Battle of Little Bighorn in June of 1876, the truth is that less than half of the 647 men under his command were killed in the famous battle. The reason for this was twofold. First, some of his men were assigned to drive and guard the lengthy wagon train that followed in the army's wake, and so were too far away at the time to be involved. And secondly, Custer had divided his command between himself and Major Reno in an effort to make a two-pronged attack. Reno's assault, which preceded Custer's by an hour or so, was driven off with heavy casualties, but most of it emerged from the battle intact. I thought he divided in three, but guess not. It was only those companies that rode with Custom, about 210 men in all, that were entirely wiped out. 
Number one, the USA was chiefly responsible for defeating Germany in World War I and World War II. I've never heard someone While say American that. American material and military support was imperative and likely ensured an eventual Allied victory, it was others who bore the brunt of the fighting against Germany in both wars. Yeah. In World War I, the US was late to the show, not making it to France in significant numbers until late in 1917. It was the British and French who had been doing all of the fighting up until then, and had battered the Germans by the time the US entered the fray. In the Second World War, things were much the same, with American troops not arriving in theatre until very late in the war. While they fought largely rearguard actions in North Africa and Italy, by the time they landed in force in France in June 1944, the Germans were already reeling from the massive Soviet juggernaut that was rolling over them from the east. In fact, over 80% of all German casualties in World War II came on the Eastern Front. While it was the US that was chiefly responsible for defeating Japan in the Pacific, it was the Soviet Union that did most of the heavy lifting in Europe. So I really hope you found that video interesting. If you did, please I do did. give us a like below and also subscribe great. to our channel okay. if you haven't already. Also, over there on the right are a I couple feel like of the person who sent this one in knows me. It doesn't take much to get me to watch a history video. This particular channel I haven't seen anything else from i believe it's called top tens with a z i'll make sure to link them in the bio for you to check out and i'll probably look at what other titles they have because i'd like to watch more from them it's interesting how our understandings of history change over time as we get presented with new information and then there's also the factor of misremembering what we're taught which I think might be the case for the first solo nonstop flight one, for example. Personally, I misremember things that I was taught in fourth grade all of the time. So there's that. Feel free to expand on any of the 10 points that he brought up or clarify any of them as well. I'll probably have to look into, what was it? Number nine of Little Big Horn and Custer's 7th Calvary. Cavalry. <laughs> Other than that, for a literary recommendation, Rise and Fall of the Third Reich, because I mentioned it before, it's by William Shire, Shearer. I'm not sure. Okay, I'll find the author for you. But that one is World War II related. And then because he mentioned the Great Depression, there's a book called Reminiscence of a Stock Operator. And it tells the story of stock trader Jesse Livermore around the time of the Great Depression. And if you like trading or investing, it gives some solid lessons because Jesse Livermore at some points was using way too much leverage, but then also making markets and manipulating markets before SEC regulation was a thing. I learned a lot about risk management through that book. So... I'll make sure to link that down below as well. I don't think I've recommended that title before. If you can think of any more books on any of the subjects that he touched on, feel free to add them down below. And that's all for me. Leave your thoughts on any of it. Thanks for watching with me.